الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونتوب اليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ان الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا ايها الذين امنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى ال محمد وعلى اصحابه اجمعين اما بعد Dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum. Today I want to reflect on death. Uh, this is an old saying in American culture, attributed often to Ben Franklin, that there are only two things that you can be certain of in this life. One is taxes and the other is death. Uh, if you are a Muslim actually, there is only one thing that you are certain of, death. Taxes, perhaps if you are giving zakat as ibadah, then there should be no taxes. So we are only sure of one thing about death. Death is, we talk a lot about death. Uh, there is a lot of discussion of death in the Quran. There is a lot of discussion of death uh, in the traditions. Oftentimes, uh, in the khutbahs, you will hear uh, the khatib asking you to prepare for death. Uh, many, many years ago in India and Pakistan, the Tablighi Jamaat had come up with a very cute advertisement. They said, Namaz pahiye se pehle ki aapki namaz padhai jai. Pray before you are prayed upon. It was a very nice way of saying. Uh, it was a paraphrasing of an often said Sufi saying, which is die before you die. So, so there are lots of, in Muslim culture, there are lots of references to death. And in Islamic literature, of course, there are a lot of discussion, but it is always very difficult to understand what it is. It is very difficult to cope with it. I was there, present, subhanAllah, when my father died. And uh, it was a very traumatic experience for me. And I also, it was like I was in two forms. I was not only doing what I needed to do, but I was also observing myself. So I my personality split into two. So I was watching myself and I was doing what I thought. The first thing that I did was I donated all the machinery in his body. He had all these expensive pacemakers and defibrillators, etc. And in a poor country, they actually used those things in India. So I made sure that the doctor who was there recovered those devices and asked him to make sure if he can use them. So he, they were very happy because they were worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. But the second thing that I did was, it was a very difficult thing to call my mother and tell her that this happened. How do I tell her what happened? But when I called her, she already knew. She understood. I didn't have to say it. So she said, I'm just coming. The second thing that I did was to go and look at her passport. This was in India to see when her visa was expiring. And I realized that her visa to the US was expiring in 13 days. And that's what I did. In the next 12 days, I did everything. Made sure that I tried to find out if there was anybody who owed my father money. I mean, my father owed money to them. Found, alhamdulillah, nobody. There were lots of people who did owe him money. I told them it's okay. And then buried my father. I got down into the grave myself. And when I was doing that, a lot of people kept telling me, you were so blessed. And I didn't know what to make of it. Then on the way back, within 12 days, I sold my house, shut everything down. There's nothing left behind and brought my mother over. But on the plane, I tried to think about it. 16 hours of flying, I was trying to cope and understand what it meant. And I realized that I had an underlying anger. I was feeling angry because I felt that I was too young to lose my father. I was already 30 years old by then and I couldn't find comfort. And then while I was thinking about it, it, it hit me because I was flying with my son sitting next to me who was about a year and a half at that time. And I realized that Rasulullah had neither father nor son. His father died early and so did both of his sons. 
And I realized that Allah Ta'ala has already blessed me more in some ways, at least in terms of the amount of time I was able to find. But I never understood what it meant. I mean, I know if people had asked me at that time in the plane, I could probably stand up and give a lecture on what death is and tell them what philosophers have said about death and what other religions say and what Islam says about death. But knowing what is in books is very different from understanding, to have fact, to have an understanding which comforts your heart to say you know what it means. You are never going to see this person again. What is going to happen to this person? How do we communicate with this person? And so on. So that question always remains. And I realized that, that this anxiety is very interesting until I was with Imam al Ghazali talking about attitude towards death. He said, we have three kinds of attitude towards death. One attitude of death is fear and loathing of death. So those who are aghafir, those who are heedless, or those who are in love with the life of this life, hate death, because death is an end of this life. So they see, imagine if you are a very rich person and you are having a lot of fun in this world. Death will be an end to this pleasure that you are experiencing every day. So you hate that. You don't want the fun to stop. And that is the attitude of those who are losers, khasirun. God has a special reception planned for these people. It is an indication, your love for this life is a clear indication of your divorce from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is when you disconnect from God that you connect with this life. And so one attitude, Imam Bazali says, is this loathing of death. This, oh my God, it is such a horrible thing, it ends. The second attitude towards death is the attitude of one who repents, the one who does tawbah. The one who does tawbah is also afraid of death. But he's afraid of death for two reasons. One, he says that maybe I will die before I have repented and made up for the sins that I have committed. So you do not want to die before you have settled your account with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Islamic tradition, it is considered very bad to die with your accounts left. I mean, you do not want your children to inherit debt. So one of the things that you should do is to settle your accounts before you die. In fact, you should not bury a person until you settle a person's accounts. Don't bury somebody until you find out whether he has any debts and try and pay it off. I find it amazing that we have fundraising for everything, but we never have fundraising to pay off the debts of dead brothers and sisters in the community. I think someday the American Muslim community will become generous enough to ask that question. Are there any debts of this person that's paid off before we bury the person? But even those who are conscious of this, I mean their height of taqwa is very high, even they need to understand that we also have a debt to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Prayers which haven't done, charities which haven't been given, zakat which hasn't, we still owe. So we need to fulfill all these debts. So one who repents, one who is in a state of tawbah, is afraid of dying because of two things. One, he feels that he may die before he pays off his debt to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the second is he's afraid of what would happen to him when he is presented in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Will his record stand up to scrutiny? That is the second fear. You are afraid. That is the state of taqwa. You are constantly afraid. Have I lived a life which will meet the approval of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If I live the life, we shall meet the approval of But the third stage, Imam Ghazali talks about the third kind of attitude towards death, is the attitude of the Arifin, those who know. Those who know and fully understand what is death, they neither have fear nor loathing. For them, death is not an end, it is the beginning. Now, see, I have read these kind of things before, I have said it before, but what does it mean? I mean, how do you understand it? 
I can understand it with my mind, but I can't understand it with my heart. What does it mean to be able to come to terms with the idea of death? So, what is death? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim in Surah Al Baqarah. When I love you, I'm going be shame in the Hof, or Joe, or nothing, in the Amral, or I'm going to say, or some of He says, and you will surely test you with something of fear, and hunger, and a loss of wealth, and, and lights, and fruits, and etc. But giving good tidings to the person who is suffering from these losses. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الذين إذا صابتهم مصيبة قالوا إن الله وإن الله راجعون. Who then, when disaster strikes them, who say, indeed we belong to Allah and indeed who we are. This, I'm sure all of you are familiar with this. إن الله وإن الله راجعون. Every time people die, we say that. Now with social media, you can see it. In fact, people have become. I don't know how to say this. Our culture has become so strange that when we see some death news, we just copy paste. It's not that we are even writing. We just look at someone who is already written above us in Alilahe wa Inna We just copy that and cut and paste into the next line, and we feel it is done. But this is what I'm talking about. This is the philosophy of death in Islam. Inna Alilahe wa Inna Ilayhi wa and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues, this is in Surah Al-Baqarah, أُولَٰئِكَ عَلَيْهِمْ سَغَرَاتٍ مِّنْ رَبِّهِمْ وَرَحْمَةٍ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمَحْتَدٍ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing the fitra or the quality of those who say إِنَّ لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّ إِلَيْهِ When you are in trouble, when you are in distress, when you have lost a beloved, and it's not just a loss of a person, you've lost your property, you have lost your job, you are suffering from anxiety, there is somebody in your family, may Allah protect us all, who has fallen sick. So in all these moments of stress and distress, those who say, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi indeed we belong to Allah and indeed to Him we will return, Allah describes them that they are the ones whom are blessings from the Lord and mercy. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when you genuinely respond to an adverse situation by saying in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says you become part of those you become part of those upon whom Allah has sent blessings. So what happens is every time you remember and you share this philosophy that indeed we belong to Allah. And because we belong to Allah, Allah can do whatever He likes with us. He can take away what He gave us, He can give us more. He can test us, He may forgive us. So in this state, when we accept this, you know, I, I sometimes jokingly say that I have a deal with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I accept everything that He does. He made me bald, he made me fat, and so on and so forth. I hope he also accepts everything I do. So this is the attitude, inna lillahi wa inna ilahi rajiu, that no matter what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we accept it. And we accept it with contentment. It is not a resignation. We accept it with contentment and we are truly grateful for him for both, when He blesses us with good times, we are grateful to Him, because that is also a test. And when He presents us with challenging times, we are still grateful to Him, because when we accept that condition of challenge, He sends salawat upon us. He's sending blessings upon us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is praying upon us. That is an incredible state to go on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Allati khalaqa al-maut wal hayat li yirabbikum ayyukum ahsan wa'amla wa huwa azizul ghafoor. And I've talked about this ayah before. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, indeed, He created death, and He says death first. Khalaqa al-maut. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created death, and then He created life in order to test as to how much ihsan we can do in this life. How much ihsan we can do in this life. 
The second part of this is very easy to understand, that he has created us in this life so that we may do good deeds. Those who do good deeds, inshallah, will be blessed, and those who do bad deeds, inshallah, will be forgiven. But what does it mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created death to test us? Well, that is the second part which is to me more perplexing and more difficult to understand. For many traditional Muslim scholars, if you go and read the tafsir of this ayah and classical literature, you will find that most Muslim scholars were puzzled by what does it mean by creating death. We can understand that God created life. But what is the meaning of creating death? How does it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's essence, one of his names is al mumit the one who creates death, the one who kills. So how do we understand death? Is death an event? Is death a product? Is death a process? What is it? It is like in our real life, we are used to say, oh, there is light. We turn the light off and we assume that darkness is a default status. Darkness as absence of light. Day and night. The sun goes away, it becomes night. So we keep thinking that what is created is light, what is created is sun, and when you take away what is created, what is left is darkness, etc. But it's not like that. If you take away life, what is left is not death. Because you must understand that even darkness, even death is a thing, it is a shape. And that also needs to be created. So this default world that you see, this dark world without light, is also a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no such thing as empty space. What you think of empty space is also part of the universe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created because you can expand into that space. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that he created two deaths. He created, he has resulted us twice and killed us twice. In many verses we get the sense that death is like sleep. That we go to sleep even though we are dreaming and if you kick somebody in the sleep they will surely get up and cry and feel the pain. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala draws the analogy of death to sleep. So what is missing when you sleep? It's just your sense of consciousness. You can even dream. So the best metaphor for understanding what is death is sleep. But what is happens at the end of that sleep? You awake. So what happens is that actually life is like sleep. In a very well-known hadith, Rasulullah said, you think you are awake, but you are actually all asleep. You will wake up when you die. Death is an awakening. That's when you really wake up to the realities of existence and cosmos. You will know you are Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will know what is going to happen. You will know the true meaning of this life only after death. So death is an awakening. And life is a sense of ghafala. Even if you are a very pious person, even if you are living your life 500%, thousands of times than an average good Muslim, you are still in a state of kafa. It is death will, will suddenly awaken you. So it leads to the second puzzle, what is this two stages of death? If you think of our wujud, our existence, and I'm using the word existence only to distinguish it from life. If you think of our existence, we have, let me count, how many stages? I forgot to count it. I listed them. We live in many stages. Uh, we live in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven stages. One is when we didn't exist. And Allah Ta'ala says, Kun Fayakun, and He orders us to come into existence. Even in that state, we are in a state of non-existent existence because we are obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when He ordered us to become. You are responding to an order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even though you don't exist, you can hear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even though you don't exist, you hear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when He says, be, you become. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that he collected all the children of Adam and took a covenant with them and asked them, Allah to be Rabbikum, and we said, Bala. We, we said, yes. We testify, Shahidna, we testify that you are our Lord. Now this is a, a state of existence which is prior to our birth on earth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings us out of pre-existence and has a state of covenant with us and then kills us again. And then he gives us birth on this earth, then we stay in life, then we die. And then we awake again on the day of resurrection. So there are these so many stages of pre-existence, the state of covenant, the state of birth, the state of life, the state of death. Some ulama also talk about barzakh, life in the grave, that you are waiting. Some scholars believe the day you die, you are on the day of judgment and you know where you are going. Some say you have to wait and you are aware of this wait. That's why some people when they go to, to the graveyard, they say, Assalamu alaikum ahl the Qiyamah is near. You are trying to tell people who are waiting for Qiyamah that they don't have to wait too long because they are in a state of barzakh between life and death. And then you read Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's final state. So those who know, for them, Death is a portal. You know what a portal is, right? Yahoo.com is a portal. Google.com is a portal. It's a big door to something else. So you go to that point and you go beyond. So death is a door. It is a door to the greater world, to the eternal world, to the spiritual world. So when you die, if you are among the Arifin, you're not, it's like saying you're just moving. Today you live in Delaware, to me, tomorrow you may get a job elsewhere and you move. You're not going to behave as if you are, the world has come to an end. So death is not the end of existence. Death is just a transportation from one form of existence to another form of existence. And those who believe that in the life of the hereafter, we will see our Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For them, it is a joy. It is a joy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that those who, who have the spirit are those who believe in the lillahi wa inna ilahi rabi. Indeed, we all have to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this in many, many ways. He says in Surah al ghashiyah for example, he says, inna ilayna iyabahum. Indeed, to us, they will return. And then, of course, some in our reina I will take account of them. But indeed, to us, they will return. This is a little worse. I mean, I've been reciting this surah for many, many years. This is the longest surah that I recite, especially in the Fajr, for example. Inna ilayna yaba. And then it struck me that I now I have an idea of what death is. Death is homecoming. Death is homecoming. Inna ilayna yaba. So when you die, you are returning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's like you're going back to your home. You're going to that maqam from where you came. So if this world is not your home, this world is your exile from home. So you're in a state of exile and you're returning to your home. So how should you live this life then? A true believer who is indeed in love with his Lord, this in this world as if he is homesick and a lot of us are immigrants and you know this condition a lot of us uh, I would like some brothers and sisters to brothers to move this way sisters I don't know but brothers to move little to create some space if more people come so they can come in that corner and move that way so there is some more room here so move in this way in a diagonal way so, so in that way we can think of that as a return to home, homecoming. Therefore, life becomes uh, something called, it's like being homesick. A lot of us are immigrants, we feel homesick. Every time I drink a cup of tea, I feel homesick because I have not got a decent cup of tea in this country, especially outside. My wife makes good tea at home, but that. So when I'm outdoors, I'm homesick for my home and also from where I come, which a city in India which makes great tea. Every time you eat certain kinds of food, every time you watch certain sports, you feel homesick. But that is, should be your spiritual feeling, that as long as you are in this world, you are feeling homesick because indeed you have to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to whom we belong. He is our master and he is our home. And so death is a form of homecoming. 
you open the portal and you just, your form of existence changes, you do not die. I'm not a traditional scholar, so I'm always learning, always trying to understand. So everything that we share is contingent understanding, that this is my understanding now. But I can tell you, there is an ayah in Surah Ar-Rahman, it says, Kullu man alayha fan. <coughs> Everything that exists will perish except the face of Allah. Some of the scholars and some of the translators have said, Everything on earth will perish, which is, I think, incorrect, because the whole universe is going to perish. So, that throws this whole idea of, so it raises the question, if everything is going to perish, then what is this eternal life after death? I have no answer to that. You need to reflect for yourself. And in matters of this issue, which are not verifiable, which are not verifiable, you need to do zikr and you need to do fikr. You remember Allah according to his names. You want to understand death, remember Allah as the one who kills, the one who destroys, al mahmid Do zikr of that and perhaps you will find an understanding which is comforting to you. I, I wanted to share with you some of the sayings of a very famous Indian poet called Ghalib. Unfortunately, Muslim poetry, which has been mystical and spiritual, has been appropriated by film industries and popular collections and been ruined. So much so that Muslims themselves have lost the true meaning of what this poetry is. This poet says, Yenati hamari khismat ke visale yaar hota, agar aur jeete rehte, yuhi intaza hot. He said, this is not my good fortune that I would meet my beloved in this life. And now I am dead. But if I was alive, I would still be waiting for him. Now people have used this in a romantic sense, but what he is actually trying to say that there is no true union with your Lord in this life. There is no true union and there is no need to prolong this waiting. So he is actually waiting for death with the joy. So that when he dies, he will have this true union with his beloved. He goes on to say, Do not believe in this promise of life. If you believe in this promise of life, you are lost. If you believe in this promise of life, you are lost. If I had faith, wouldn't I die with joy? And that is a very interesting faith. He's saying that those who have faith, they will die with joy. Now it means two things. You will die of joy, which means if you have faith, the joy and happiness that you experience is so overwhelming that you cannot live. It will kill you. Happiness is so overwhelming that it will kill you. The other meaning is that you will die with joy, that your process of dying will be joyful. So when you realize that you are dying, you won't be afraid. When you realize that you are dying, you won't be paranoid, you won't be worried about what's happening to you next, or what's going to happen to your people, your family that you're leaving behind, you will joyfully die. Because you know you're going to meet your beloved, and you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised to take care of everybody that he has created. So that is joyful for those. He ends it up by saying, Ye he says, these issues which are mystical and your beautiful rendition, I would have considered you as a friend of Allah if you were not an alcoholic, if you were not such a loser. So basically, this last part clearly tells you that the first few poem verses are about death and mystical conceptions of death. So how do we learn to live with this mystical conceptions of death? In the second part of the khutbah, inshallah, I will try and share a few more thoughts before I'm running out of time, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that every soul will test death. 
every soul will test death. And the purpose of this is very important. It is like a, a ritual of growing up. Dying and experience. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created that. So it's an experience that you can taste. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to experience this. Because without experiencing death, you will not earn the right to see him. You will not earn the right. You have to enter this portal. Which means for some people you will say everybody experiences death. Yes, every soul will experience death because it has a transformative effect on you. It will transform your soul. It will disengage you from this corporeal world and bring you into the spiritual world. So experiencing death, tasting death. And it's very interesting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses Zahir Fatuma. It's a taste of death. Because taste is just something that you do a little, you know, take a little and that's it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that there is maybe something bigger to death than what we experience. There may be something bigger to death than what we experience because all we are getting is just a taste of death. Now that is an important part. And and I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rabbana ta'ina fi dunya hasnatun fi l'akhirati hasnatun fi n'azabana that he allows us to reflect on death without fear. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gives us the sabr and he gives us the faham, the understanding and the patience to reflect on death without fear. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gives us the ability to prepare for death. One of the qualities of death is its surprise. It is quite possible that somebody here may not be here next Jummah. May Allah forgive their sins, grant them makhara. But that is the thing. Death comes suddenly, unexpectedly, without informing you. So we have to be a continuous state of preparation for death. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should give us the fortitude to be ready for death any time. And that readiness for death comes not from fear of death. What we fear, we avoid. What we fear, we avoid. Look at your children. If they are afraid of a particular subject, they stop studying that subject. Because they are afraid of it. You need to engage it more. So we need to prepare for death. And the only way you can prepare for death is if you are not afraid of death. Don't postpone any good deeds that you can do today. Don't postpone any repentance that you can do today. Don't postpone any remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you can do today. When you remember Allah, also remember death. Because death is a portal to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I also pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us all the nana of dying with dignity. This is very important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the nana to die with dignity. A lot of people have said that those who have lived virtuous life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them the death of their choice. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the death of dignity. It is like, look at us, when we are coming to Jummah, you get up early, you bathe, you try to wear your best clothes, you press your shirt, so on. I was about to leave my house, my wife dragged me back and said, your shirt needs to be pressed further, so I had to press it again to leave. So you are trying to go to the masjid, trying to look at your best, you are trying to, to go there with a personal sense of dignity. And if you are going to go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you need to have a higher degree of preparation. So I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us all this capacity to prepare for death and pray that we all get a death of dignity. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He elevates us in our understanding. That we go to the state of the Arifin who know fully from their heart that death is not an end. Death is a beginning. Ya ayyuhal lazina amanu askurullaha zikran kaseeran Bismillah ar-Rahmani ar-Rahim Inna Allah ya'amu bit al-di wa laysan wa ita al-qurba wa yanan al-fashar al-munkra baghiya aizakum la'annakum tadakkurun wa aqimu as-salam Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar 
الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا أفحسبتم أنما خلقناكم عبثا وأنكم إلينا لا ترجعون فتعالى الله الملك الحق لا إله إلا هو رب العرش الكريم ومن يدع مع الله إلها آخر لا برهان لا برهان له به فإنما حسابه عند ربه إنه لا يفلح الكافرون وقل رب اغفر وارحم وأنت خير الراحمين الله الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا بقادر على أن يحيي 